Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, I thought I might like to see these maps. They show us the entirety of the year 2020. And what you're looking at here first is the average temperature rank by climate district. Now, you can feel free to pause the video and take a look at your particular region, but I want to talk about the pattern that got us to this particular temperature anomaly map. And we're going to do that by looking at precipitation. Same map. Remember, the closer you are to the number one, that would be the wettest such time period on record. 120 would be the driest. We saw prolific drought across the western part of the United States, flash drought in the central part of the U.S., including a major section of the Corn Belt there. But then because the southeast saw a very wet last winter and spring, followed by uh, the most active hurricane season on record with respect to the number of name systems, where we even had 12 of those name systems hit the southeastern part of the United States, you see a lot of ones, twos, threes, and fours down there. But when we think about this, I want to come back to a conversation that I had with a good friend of mine, Steve Bridge. He uh, works out of Springfield. And on the radio, we had an interview the other day. And the interview was about drought. Because currently, when you look here at the latest drought monitor, and we're going to get a new one of these later on today, okay? Uh, the latest drought monitor that released on Christmas Eve here shows us just extensive drought across the central and western part of the United States. I do expect some change to this map when it is released later today, and specifically that change will be coming across the eastern part of the United States. Where over the last week, we've seen quite a bit of precipitation stretching from parts of the Mid-South, getting over to the southeast, and then of course in the northeastern part of the United States. We have had some improvement in the moisture along the West Coast as well, primarily in parts of California, coastal Oregon, and Washington. But overall, when we look at this, the question that Steve asked me that I'd like to address is, you know, when we see that much drought stretched across the western half of the United States, it gets a lot of people thinking about the last time we saw extensive drought across the U.S. like this. And for many, that was back in 2012. So I'd like to take you back to December 27th, 2011 to show you what the drought monitor looked like. You can see that it's quite different. The drought was really anchored here over the southern plains of the United States, partly over the southeast, and it was still dry in the northern plains over toward Minnesota, Wisconsin. But the western United States, not nearly at the level of drought that it currently is. Now, let's take a look at the difference between the evolution of things from the end of 2011 through 2012 and then come back and compare it to now to see if there are any pieces that are linking together. So this is an animation of the drop monitor. And as I play this forward, I'm going to pull it along a little bit quicker here so we can see a few things. Watch as we go from January here into February and in through March as to how the drought really spread. In fact, why don't we just go all the way up to May 1st? You see, during that time period, overall, the drought picture didn't change too much, except for we saw the expansion of it back a little bit to the west. The drought that was here over the northern plains, some places in the Dakotas actually improved, but the drought of the southeast continued to expand. Now, let's take off those drawings and keep our animation going. From May here in 2012 into June, now watch this, from June through July, and then at the end of July into August, we saw expansive drought. It moved in multiple directions to occupy the midsection of the United States. And I'd like to show you what has to happen in the atmosphere for something like this to occur. And I also want to just tell you right now, there is honestly no point in attempting to predict something like this happening. So the lesson we're about to go through here is one where we have to understand what must happen in order for drought like this to uh, come back again. Okay, so let's start here by looking at ocean temperatures. Now, we know that La Nina and El Nino do have an impact on our summer precipitation patterns across North America. But let's take you back here to the end of 2011. And what I want to point out was we were still seeing the remnants of a multi-year La Nina. And you can see the cooler water in through here. But it was warming here uh, over on this side of South America. But I'm most interested in the cool water that was right here off of the west coast of North America. And here's why. Because by the time it got to July the 5th, this had all warmed up considerably. But look at still this region right in through here that remained on the cooler side of things. That was a part of the background setup of the flow of the atmosphere that gave us this next series of, of images. Oh, first... 
It's important to see where we are right now. So our La Nina, yes, we've been seeing some warming here and it is still quite cool and the trade winds are strong there. But do notice, see how much warm water we have into this region. So before I show you that pattern, let's at least do this. The forecast is to not yet see a large area of cool water emerge into this particular region. As you can see here, the longer range models, well, they're allowing this La Nina to fade. You can see it here fading away through spring, but we don't yet see the emergence of a lot of cold water again right in this area like we saw in spring of 2012. That's one major difference I think that's important to notice. So what does that mean? If this region begins to cool off, that would be something I think we should take note of as a potential uh, lead indicator for drought issues across the United States for, um, for next year. From here though, let's now come back to that pattern analysis, March. Now, many of us across the Midwest remember March 2012 as being one of the warmest marches on record. And you can see here why. Just follow what the gesture is doing. Deep troughs over Alaska. So the flow came right in between here, dove like this across the west, and then ran up over this large ridge that sat right over the Great Lakes. So that brought us in a very warm and dry March and got folks really cranking early on getting the growing season going. Then into April, we continued to see troughing off of the west coast in the Gulf of Alaska over that cooler water. Broad ridging across the U.S. Ridges synonymous with drier conditions, a further uh, northward trajectory of the jet stream and warmth from April into May. Look again, a deep trough here of Alaska. So the jet stream came around that stayed north way up here, stayed up in Canada. We saw broad warmth, a lack of strong jet stream winds across the United States, and it would continue to get drier. Then into June, this is where the pattern became really bunched up. Watch this trough here ridge over the Aleutian Islands, trough over the Gulf of Alaska, ridge that built here toward the Great Lakes and then extended here toward Greenland. See that? Have you noticed that in all of these images, I keep talking about ridging that's happening here with respect to troughing that's happening in the Gulf of Alaska. You see that again in July of 2012. You see right in through this area, a ridge was basically established between, you know, Manitoba uh, coming down to North Dakota and over to Minnesota, this region right in through here, including parts of Western Ontario. And that ridge sent the jet stream just north. It just kept it here. And the circulation at the surface was doing this, not returning Gulf moisture back into the midsection of the country. And it got very hot and very dry. And then it decided to break down into August, but it was too late. The damage was already done. And by the way, a ridge building here in August produces flow that comes over the top and then cuts underneath right here into this trough. Now you end up getting convergent winds in the upper levels of the atmosphere. And all you can get out of this pattern is scattered storms that run from northwest to southeast. We call that northwest flow in summer, a good scattered thunderstorm pattern, but this was too little too late. So thinking about all of that, let's now look at how much the moisture profile changed. As we discussed the drought back in April that was here and in the plains and also still in parts of the Southern Plains, well, it moved by the time we got into August to occupy a large, a large section of the United States. The Northwest was wet. California didn't see the expansive drought development like it saw in 2019 and excuse me, like it did in 2020. But one last thing to think about here, what happened during that winter? Well, December through February, look, the jet stream pattern came screaming just like this, stayed pretty far to the north, but there was a lot of troughing over Alaska and also over Greenland. The ridging sat right here off the coast and here in the North Atlantic. That was winter 2011 into 2012. What have we had so far? Not that pattern. You see, we've had much deeper troughs over the Aleutian Islands and the flows come up over a bigger ridge that sat here with another ridge that's there. So in other words, this pattern has to change quite a bit for us to see, well, what we saw back at the end of winter in 2012. That's the point I want to make. But I want to begin this discussion because I'm getting asked a lot of questions about the similarities given how extensive the drought is across the Western United States. So I hope you found this informative, but also I want you to know that right now, 20... 11 into 2012 is not a good analog for 2020 into 2021. And the long range models are all over the place with the summer forecast. That's why I'm not even going to show them to you. So an extended start to this video, but I want to make this, this point very clear. So what are we dealing with now? Well, this is what the remainder of our winter is forecast to feature. And those troughs are not over here where they were in 2011 into 2012. The forecast is to keep them more between Alaska and the Canadian prairie. 
and that is also a different look. So what should we expect? Wetter conditions here, active Ohio River Valley storm track, potentially drier along the southern tier of the United States. That's been the forecast for a long time from the long range European model. Why I'm giving this to you now is because in my next briefings next week after the 5th, we're going to get new long range maps like this and I want to keep this fresh in your minds. All right, what's going on now? Well, there's a pair of powerful, tro uh, excuse me, not tropical, pro extra tropical cyclones that are cranked up here in the Pacific Ocean. And by the time we get to this weekend, look at what the jet stream will be doing across the Pacific. A large and very fast zonal pocket of winds here that are slamming into the West Coast, which means over the next 10 days, the West Coast is going to be seeing well, you're going to notice in a few moments quite a bit of precipitation. But look at these deep troughs that are digging all the way down into Mexico and Texas before running up the East Coast. That's going to be producing a pair of low pressure systems. The first one coming through here over the next three days, that's going to be quite powerful. So we better get in and talk about that because our next 10 days features wetter conditions here and well above average precipitation inside of that second area. Who's missing out on this? A lot of the northern plains of the United States getting into the Canadian prairie, as you can see here. So that's an important thing to be thinking about as we talked about drought at the beginning of this video. From there, all hazards weather map valid early this morning. We have winter storm watches, winter weather advisories, and winter storm warnings. That's the pink in through here already setting up here in this particular quarter with flood watches out ahead of it. Winter weather advisories in this region too and also extending into parts of the northeast. The same thing is going to be seen a lot across the west coast with the strong onshore flow we're expecting. So let's get right on into this and look at the high resolution NAM. We're going to pause this early this morning. So that deep trough is still sitting down here and you can see it's kind of daisy chained with this frontal boundary into an exiting low off the northeast. Okay, some snow on the back side of this here early this morning. As we play this through though, what you're going to notice is that this trough begins to produce a great upper level lift here. And we're going to see a lot of snow on the back side of it in this part of Texas, mixing over to sleet and freezing rain here, but then rain out ahead of it as the warm, moist air pushes out ahead of this. Now, the problem is it's going to be overrunning some cool air at the surface. So well, as we're celebrating the beginning of 2021 here, this is 1 a.m. Central Time, you will be seeing freezing rain spreading into this part of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri and parts of Arkansas. Now, snow on the back side of that moves right through this part of Texas and Oklahoma as we go then through the day on Friday. If you're driving home from a party, okay, and you are in this area, be very, very careful and on the lookout for freezing rain because that's going to continue to spread farther to the north across parts of Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio as this low pulls to the north. And you can see the snow on the back side of it. Now to the south, I, I don't want to fail to, to, to mention this, we could see some strong to severe storms in the lower Mississippi River Valley through Mississippi, Arkansas, excuse me, Alabama into Georgia. But as this low pulls on farther to the north throughout the day on Friday, we can see the mixture of precipitation types pulling through parts of Illinois into Michigan, out of Indian, Ohio, and then parts of the northeast. You can now see the freezing rain here into parts of the northeast. Well, this is 1 a.m. Saturday, and the second system is starting to take shape right in through here, and I'll show you that in just a few moments. But first, severe weather. Today, we're going to be watching right down here along the Gulf Coast. This will then move toward the east on uh, Friday. And then also on Saturday, we're going to watch the same corridor here for the potential for strong to severe storms. But from there, watch how the European model takes the systems after this. So we've watched all the way until this point here. This is now Saturday afternoon, getting into Saturday evening and then in the overnight hours. So there's the secondary low that comes through, possibly bringing some light snow to parts of Illinois, you know, this region right in through here. And as you see here, chances for heavier precipitation and possibly some embedded thunderstorms here on Saturday night, moving through parts of Georgia and the Carolinas. Meanwhile, you can see our next system is hitting the Pacific Northwest. I don't want to leave the Northwest out of this because they're going to have multiple systems coming through. Getting through the day on Sunday, that low pulls into the northeast, as you can see here, and another powerful low is ready to hit the west. See it there? Now, while this is happening, and one low is on the northeast, one low is in the northwest, there's a little clipper system that comes through parts of the Canadian prairie. It might bring some light snow in through this region throughout the day on Monday. 
But for many in the midsection of the country, next week is going to be dominated by higher pressure and some calmer conditions in terms of precipitation. Some light snow on Tuesday, January 5th, possibly pushing through the eastern Corn Belt and the Great Lake Basin. From here, though, what we're going to see is that getting out into midweek next week, this is Wednesday, with the high pressure sliding farther to the east, that's a return of a lot of warm air in the midsection of the country. And it's possibly going to fuel a system maybe a, a, you know, a week from now, next Thursday in the midsection of the United States. But do notice yet again, more systems coming into the western part of the United States, whereas we saw earlier quite a bit of heavy precipitation being forecast. So let's boil this down with the first system in terms of ice. This is the ice accumulation map from the European model through Saturday afternoon. And remember, this is the corridor through which I was most concerned. From there, let's turn this over to snow. Unlike the last system, which brought quite a bit of snow in through this part of the U.S., this one has a much smaller band of heavier snow on its backside, stretching from Texas through the southern plains into Missouri, clipping Iowa, Illinois, and over toward Michigan before bringing more snow here into the northeast. What you've got right here in the part of the Ohio River Valley, this is coming from the front that's sliding through early, early this morning. From there, let's take a look at total accumulated precipitation. This is, again, only through Saturday afternoon. Just take a look here. You can see that out ahead of this, we're looking at some locations here picking up maybe two inches of precipitation. But now that we've seen this map, why don't we transition from here to look at the time period beyond this. So we're now going to look at days four through ten. Remember with that strong onshore flow in the western part of the United States, precipitation amounts are really, really starting to crank up here in along the west coast of the United States. What I'm concerned about, though, is that there is a region right in through here due to that almost straight from west to east flow that is going to miss out on a lot of the activity. I'm talking about the southern plains to the northern plains, and that's an area we're concerned about drought. But we stay quite active and wet here in the southeast to the northeast as we look out here all the way to the 10th of the month. So starting there, day 10, this is an important feature. That is a large ridge that's part of the negative North Atlantic Oscillation. As you can see, though, the ensemble and the operational model continue just to toss these troughs coming out of Alaska. They're coming in this direction, and they come into the United States. There's a problem here, though, and the problem is there's not a lot of very cold air attached with each one of these troughs. And because of that, as the precipitation comes through the United States, which we are expecting, as you can see here, to be quite normal for the U.S. It'll be wetter than average here and possibly wetter than average along the East Coast, but normal across the U.S. With the warmer conditions that I expect to see in place here, I'm not expecting a lot of big, big, big snows far to the south, okay? Let me show you what I mean. Here's today's high temperatures compared to normal. So again, we can see how warm it is compared to normal up here in the northern plains. But with this system taking shape out of Texas, you're going to see that behind it and along that, there's going to be some colder air here with the warmer air being advected or moved out of the south ahead of it here uh, and through parts of the Tennessee Valley. Now from there, going from Friday's high temperatures into Saturday, that system starts to move to the east, right? And as we go from Saturday into Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, you see a lot of mild conditions, again, compared to normal for this time of year, stretched across the United States. And that's what I meant by not letting those troughs really get anchored to a lot of colder air. From here, let's go out and look at the day 5 through 10 pattern. With the negative phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation pushing all that warmth, you can see it going to the north there over the Canadian Maritimes. And overall, the pattern tends to favor near normal to above average temperatures across the majority of the United States. Going out here, though, to the middle of January, the models do split a little bit on here <clears throat> with respect to their temperature patterns. The operational GFS ensemble here, keeping the warmth across a broader sector here of the United States and Canada, but the European favoring cooler conditions to the south. So my point is that through the next 10 days, each of these systems are going to have a difficult time producing a lot of snow farther to the south uh, than we could get if the colder air was in place. But maybe toward the middle of the month, we'll have to be watching this carefully. There's one last thing we're going to have to watch toward the middle of the month, and that is what's going on with the polar vortex. We're expecting by January 10th for the polar vortex to be split into two separate smaller vortices. This is going to disrupt the stratospheric wind flow by pulling in this large ridge into place here in the stratosphere. At this point, when I look at this, I think that the displacement is going to have a major effect on Europe, not necessarily on the United States. 
but that is yet to be seen to see how the polar stratospheric vortex connects with the troposphere. So we'll keep you updated as we begin our new year. I appreciate your attention this year. Hope you all have a safe and happy new year. Thank you.